Without objection. Uh, following in the tradition of the Senate, I come to the floor to uh, speak about my experiences in the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, this won't be the last time I speak, uh, much to many of your chagrin, as I have some adamant opposition to some of the things that we're doing. But I nevertheless will uh, try to put in context some of my feelings and thoughts about the great privilege that has been granted to me by the people of Oklahoma. We hear, we hear a lot of speeches in this place and as members who are elected um, it gets reflected on us. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because the thing that really makes this place operate is the people that work with us. The people that support us. The people that help guide us. Would you please take your conversations outside? The Senate will come to order. The people behind the scenes who are both brilliant and committed and dedicated to the founding principles of this country. And we all have them working for us. And yet they're rarely recognized. And so whether our accomplishments are big or small, those accomplishments come through the, the work efforts and labors of those that join with us as we come here to try to make a difference. So I first wanted to say that there are a lot of people I need to say thank you to. From our parliamentarian, Elizabeth, to all the staff that works here in the Senate. To the people who work. At GAO, wonderful people. CRS, the IGs, Ledge Council, they've written thousands, I mean literally thousands of amendments for me. They're probably going to have some real mixed feelings about my departure. And then I have personal staff. One of which, all tremendous, but one of which I, I found to be a phenomenal, brilliant person. His name's Roland Foster. There's not anything he's ever forgotten. <laughs> you can ask him anything. He'll find it. He knows it. And so I, I, I mentioned him. I have hundreds of others that I could equally speak about. From my <clears throat> former chief of staff, Mike Schwartz, who passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease, to those in my office and staff that each know what a difference they made. And they did. The cloakroom staff and the help that we get from Laura Dove and David Chiapa and Mr. Duncan on our side. Same on the, the opposite side. 
We're only able to function because of all the people that enable us to do that. And so with those thank yous, I, I actually wanted to move to a, really a, a different topic. Uh, and, and the topic is believing in our country. I tell, tell people wherever I go, we do not have one problem we can't solve. There's nothing too big for us. They're all solvable. And, and to prove that is my chairman, Tom Carper, on Homeland Security. He's been a phenomenal chairman. He's not of my party. We don't agree on everything. But the one thing we agreed on was that we were going to work together to solve problems. And we have. We didn't solve them all. But I would suggest if you look at what's come through this place, even in this dysfunctional place at this time, you'll see more coming out, out of his leadership than any other pieces of legislation. And why is that? It's because the focus wasn't about him. It wasn't about me. It was about solving the problems of our country. To those of you through the years who I have offended, I truly apologize. And I think <clears throat> none of that was intended because I actually see things different. You see, I believe our founders were absolutely brilliant. Far smarter than us. I believe the enumerated powers meant something. They were meant to protect us against what history says always happens to a republic. They've all died. They've all died. So the question is, is what will happen with us? Can we cheat history? Can we do something better? than it's done in the past. And I honestly believe we can. But I don't believe we can if we continue to ignore the wisdom of our founding documents. And so when I have offended, I believe it's been on the basis of my belief in Article 1, Section 8. I think we can stuff that genie back into the bottle. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. But you don't have one unless you've guaranteed the liberty of the many. And when we ignore what the Constitution gave us as a guideline, 
to protect the individual liberties, to limit the size and scope of the federal government so that the, the benefit of freedom and liberty can be expressed all across this land, that's when we get back to solving our problems. I think about my father. He had a fifth grade education. A great believer in our country. He wouldn't recognize it today. The loss of freedom that we have imposed by the arrogance of an all too powerful central government, ignoring the wisdom and writings of our founders that said, above all, we must protect the liberty of the individual and recognize that liberty is given as a God-given right. So my criticism isn't directed personally. It's because I purely believe that freedom gains us more than anything we can plan up here. And I know not everybody agrees with me, but the one thing I do know is our founders agreed with me. They had studied this process before. They knew what happens when you dominate from a central government. And it doesn't mean intentions are bad. The intentions are great. The motivations of people in this body are wonderful. But the perspective on how we do it and what the long-term consequences of how we do it really do matter. And so we see ourselves today with a president that we need to be supporting and praying for with an economy that's not doing what it could be doing. And we need to be asking the questions, why? Is there a fundamental reason? And there is. We're too much involved in the decision-making in the economy in this country that inhibits the flow of capital to the best return, which inhibits the growth of wealth, which leaves us at a standard of living the same as what we had in 1988. That's where we are. And yet it doesn't have to be that way. I'm going to read you some things you've all heard before, but they're worth rereading. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, all of us, that among these are life, liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I look at legislation and say, how does that have an impact on those two things? And too often it has a negative impact. That to secure these rights, government are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. I don't know where we are on that continuum, but I know we're not where we were intended to be in the vision of our founders. And we are suffering, no matter where you are in this country, as a consequence of it. And we established a constitution to try to protect those rights and to delineate those rights. And we put in there the limitation of the government outlined the rights of each individual citizen upon which the government 
shall not infringe. <laughs> and yet, what comes out of this body in this Congress every day, to my chagrin, infringes those guaranteed rights. Every member of the Senate takes the same oath. And here's where I differ with a lot of my colleagues. And let me read the oath to you. Because I, I think it's part of our problem. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. Your state isn't mentioned one time in that off. Your whole goal is to protect the United States of America, its constitution, and its liberties. It's not to provide benefits for your state. That's where we differ. That's where my conflict with my colleagues has come. It's nice to be able to do things for your state, but that isn't our charge. Our charge is to protect the future of our country by upholding the Constitution and ensuring the liberty that's guaranteed there is protected and preserved. The magic number in the Senate is not 60. The number of senators needed to end debate. And it's not 51. A majority. The most important number in the Senate is one. One senator. That's how it was set up. That's how our founders designed it. And with that comes tremendous amounts of responsibility. Because the Senate has a set of rules, or at least did, that gives each individual member the power needed to advance, change, or stop legislation. And that's a tool that has to be mentored and refined and wise in its application. Most of the bills that pass the Senate never receive a vote. We all know that. It's the vast majority of the bills. They are approved by unanimous consent. It just takes a single senator to withhold consent to stop most legislation. There are many other rules and procedures a member can use. They're often referred to as arcane, but that's only because they're rarely used. They're not arcane. They were designed to protect liberty, to secure liberty, to make sure that we don't, don't follow history and fail. Every senator has the power to introduce legislation and until recently offer amendments. No single senator should be allowed to decide what the rights of another senator should be. That's tyranny. It has nothing to do with the history and classics of the Senate. To exercise the rights we've been entrusted with, we must respect the rights of others. That's the true power of our Constitution. That's also the true power of the Senate. It's what binds our nation together, and it's what's needed to make the Senate work properly again. The Senate was designed uniquely to force compromise, not to force gridlock, to force compromise. One senator had the power to stop everything for the first hundred years, but it didn't because compromise was the goal. 
Our founders understood that there were many differences between the states, both in size, geography, economy, and opinions. They united the states as one country based upon the premise that the many are more powerful than the one. As senators, we have to follow this example. I've not always done that. I admit that freely to you. I should have. As senators, we must follow the example, stand for our principles, but working to find those areas of agreements where compromise can be found to unite and move our country forward. My colleague, Senator Carper, has my admiration because he's worked tirelessly the last two years to try to accomplish that. Not all of the powers of the center are center senators are exercised on the Senate floor. Each member of the Senate has a unique role to participate and practice oversight to hold the government accountable. And that's part of our duties. Except most often, that's the part of our duties that is most ignored. To know how to reach a destination, you must first know where you are. And without oversight, effective, vigorous oversight, you'll never solve anything. You cannot write a bill to fix an agency unless you have an understanding of the problem. And you can only know this by conducting oversight, asking the tough questions, holding the bureaucrats accountable, find out what, work and what, what works and what doesn't, and know what has already been done. Effective oversight is an effective tool to expose government overreach and wasteful spending, but it also markedly exposes where we lose our liberty <coughs> and our essential freedoms. Now, I've had some fun through the years, taken some criticism for the waste book, and it's opinion, I agree. Uh, everybody that's in the waste book has a great defense of why it's there. But the real question is, is will we become efficient at how we spend the money of the American people? This is a big, big enterprise. There's no other enterprise anywhere close to the size in the world. It's not manageable unless we all agree to try to manage it and have the knowledge of it. I think there ought to be 535 waste books every year. And then we ought to have the debate about where we're not spending money wisely. And have the information at our fingertips so we make great decisions. Because quite frankly, we don't make great decisions because we don't have the knowledge. And then what knowledge we do have, we transfer to a bureaucracy to make decisions about it when we should have been guiding those things. True debates about national priorities would come about if we did effective oversight. It is the Senate, once hailed as the world's greatest deliberative body, where these differences should be argued. Our differences should be resolved through civil discourse so they're not settled in the street. Just as the Constitution provides for majority rule in our democracy while protecting the rights of the individual, the Senate must return to the principles to gain the tr trust of the electorate. And it can. Our founders believed that protecting minority views and minority rights in the Senate was essential to having a bicameral legislature that would give us balance and not move too quickly against the very fundamental principles upon which this country was based. And not out of guessing, but out of thorough knowledge of what had happened in the past. And we need to be very careful to guard both minority rights 
and the rule of law. There's no one who works in the Senate that is insignificant. Whether it's the people who serve us when we have lunch, to the highest of the high, no one is, they all deserve our ear. Each of us has value. I'd end with one final comment. The greatest power that I have not used as a senator that I would encourage you to use in the future is the power of convening. You have tremendous power to pull people together because of your position. To convene the opposite opinions. Chuck Schumer has been great at that for me. When we have a difference, he wants to get together and convene and see how we work. And that power is the power that causes us to compromise, to come together, to reach consensus. So my encouragement to you is to rethink the utilization of the power of convening. People will come to you if you ask them to come. Again, I would end by saying a great thank you to my family for their sacrifice. A great thank you to the wonderful staff I've had. And a thank you to each of you for the privilege of having been able to work for a better country for us all. Yield the floor.